we're going to go ahead and get started, I guess. Um, so if this is your first time attending, welcome to the Greener Backyard and Environmental Stewardship Workshop Series. Uh, we take place every Friday from four to five, except for last week, so I was on Thursday. Uh, so we'll be having meetings all the way until March 5th, and you can access um, the meetings using this ID and password every meeting, or you can sign up through the library um, and you'll get emails from them. So this week we're going to be talking about composting. Uh, next week will be rain barrels and the last week will be on microplastics. So if this is your first time, uh, I'll just quickly introduce myself. My name is Alora, and I am an AmeriCorps New Jersey Watershed Ambassador. So this is basically a program that's a partnership between the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection and AmeriCorps, which is kind of like an internal Peace Corps. Uh, and we do lots of different things. Um, so some of the things we do are go out into streams and assess them for my uh, macroinvertebrate diversity and like stream bank stability and things like that. Um, another big thing we do is stewardship events. So we might go out and clean up parks, uh, <coughs> beaches, things like that. And probably the biggest part of our role here is as educators, and that can take place in the form of something like this workshop series, um, as well as us going out to public schools and private schools and talking to the students um, about watersheds and uh, how we can protect them, basically. Um, for anybody that's just recently joining or is joining now. Um, so we're about to start the presentation. So if you could please mute yourself um, or I can try to do this. And then um, if you have any questions, just save them for the end or put them in the chat and I'll answer them after the presentation. So today's topic is on composting. Uh, so this is a really interesting topic, and I'm glad that a lot of other people have taken um, an interest in this. Uh, prior to being an ambassador, I actually didn't really know much about this other than that this was something a lot of people did to kind of enhance their gardening. Um, but it's actually so much more than that. It's really a, a quite scientific process. Um, so it's really dependent on microbes, so whether that's bacteria or fungi. And basically what we're doing is creating an environment in which they can thrive and speed up the process of decomposition so that we can convert one material into an organic material that we can then use in a garden or something like that. Um, so here's some pictures of some microbes, uh, which something uh, maybe that a lot of people aren't always thinking about is that there is such a diversity of microbes and they, they have different roles um, and they come in different shapes, sizes, forms, and they, they work together a lot of them. Um, and so when we create an ideal environment for them to thrive in, they um, are going to pr provide us with the service of decomposition and create a compost for us. And so there's a lot of reasons why we should compost, um, but I'm going to really focus here on the environmental aspect of it. So this is a really kind of shocking statistic, but the, the United States wastes a lot of food. And on average, we waste 30 to 40% of our food in general. And what happens to that food is it ends up going into the garbage. And that garbage will either go to an incinerator or it will go to a landfill. Um, and if it ends up in a landfill, um, it's going to decompose. And usually this will happen anaerobically, meaning without the presence of oxygen. And as a byproduct, it will create methane and carbon dioxide, and therefore it has a large carbon footprint. Um, other things that it does is it's just overall good for your garden. It can be a natural fertilizer, so it can decrease your need for um, synthetic or chemical-based fertilizers. And it also promotes beneficial bacteria and fungi to keep growing in your bacteria or in your garden. And what this does over time is um, it's going to allow your soils to retain more moisture. It's going to kind of control the rate at which nutrients are dispersed and taken up. Uh, it's going to provide structure to your soil um, so you can use it as like an amendment or something like that. So compost is very versatile in its uses, um, and we'll talk more about that throughout the presentation. 
Um, but I just wanted to quickly uh, explain how landfills work. So basically in a landfill, what's gonna happen is we're gonna put in a liner. We're gonna dig a hole in the ground and put in some sort of liner. And when you start filling that in with different kinds of wastes, whether that's food wastes or other kinds of plastic or whatnot, garbage. And typically you want that to be aerated because that is going to help with the smell. But sometimes what happens in a landfill is that it's going to become an oxidic in there, meaning that the oxygen levels are going to get so low that the anaerobic bacteria, the ones that thrive in environments without oxygen, are going to start kicking in. And what happens when those bacteria and microorganisms take over is we get the production of methane. And so we want to pay attention to the gases that are being released from this, right? So I'm, I'm sure that everybody has this preconceived notion that a landfill smells um, and that notion likely comes from the release of these gases and the rotting of the food. Um, so another thing here is that, and it's, a, it's kind of like a closed system, we try to use the leachate, which is basically this fluid that is generated throughout the decomposition process, and we try to spray it over the top to keep it moist and to allow it to keep decomposing because that's going to shrink the volume. Um, but we can see here that there's there's problems, right? Because anything we do tends to create some sort of carbon footprint. And the overall goal over time is to manage that footprint and as well as space. And when it comes to greenhouse gases, what we really wanna pay attention to in this um, diagram here is carbon dioxide versus methane. And all this is really showing you is that Methane is approximately 25 times more potent of a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And so to put that kind of into perspective, uh, if you create one methane, it's kind of like the equivalent of putting out 25 carbon dioxides. Um, and so as a refresher, in case you're not aware of what a, a greenhouse gas is, is, these are gases that are up in the atmosphere that kind of create a blanket over the planet. They help retain heat. Um, and so the more carbon dioxide and methane and, as you can see, other kinds of uh, greenhouse gases we have in the atmosphere, the more we, we retain that heat. So anything we can kind of do to decrease that is a step in the right direction. So basically every pound of material that you compost instead of putting in the garbage is a pound of material that doesn't end up in a landfill and a a pound of material that doesn't lead to the generation of carbon dioxide and methane gas. Um, so composting, re we're really trying to reinforce this aerobic decomposition so that we're not producing those harmful gases. And another aspect of this, um, instead of just the gases, is also the space, right? New Jersey, if we think of that, about our state, it's, a, it's the most densely populated state in the country. Um, and so we produce a lot of garbage. And we're not always just dealing with our garbage. Um, we also deal with a lot of New York's garbage, especially New York City. They send their garbage over to Newark, right? So we're dealing with a lot of space issues. Uh, so the more garbage we have, the more people we have, the more space that's going to take up in landfills. And so we want to start doing things that are going to, do, to take up less space. Um, and I believe at the, the moment there's, I think over a hundred landfills in New Jersey. And there's also historic landfills all over the state. Um, for example, example, like the Garden State Mall, that's built on top of a previous landfill. And if you're uh, from Sussex County, um, uh, what is it? Memory Park in Newton, that's also built on top of a previous landfill. So, We'll get into the basics now. So you can't compost everything as much as that would be great that we could recycle everything that our kitchen produces. We cannot do that. Um, so we're going to stick mainly with food scraps and leaf products. So things like twigs, branches, leaves, uh, yard clippings, uh, coffee grounds, eggs, those are all good things to compost. Um, on the other hand, we have the non-compostables. And so that's really dealing with um, meat products, dairy products. Um, you don't want to put pet wastes or anything like that in your uh, compostables. So basically anything that is like a vegetable 
or a fruit scrap or something that kind of comes from your yard, that's okay. But things that are going to kind of attract animals um, are really not great to put in there. Because our overall goal is to use this and to kind of not interfere with uh, or have like animals coming into the yard and uh, messing around with the compost. Um, so some examples of good greens and good browns. So greens are the things like like uh, vegetable scraps, whereas browns are going to be more of the things that come from your yard. So greens, I kind of think of like things that might come from the kitchen, whereas browns are kind of things that are going to come from your yard. So this could be eggshells, your leftover coffee grounds, uh, tea, uh, even like hair or feather or animal fur, you can compost that as well. Um, some good browns, that's going to be your leaves that come down, um, different kinds of branches um, and twigs, pine needles even, um, even um, paper towels or napkins. You prefer them to be unbleached though. Um, so these are all different examples. And something I want to emphasize here is that not all compostables are created equal. Um, so some are better than others. And where, where they differ is in something called their carbon and nitrogen ratio. So uh, microbes, they're going to decompose most efficiently when that carbon to nitrogen ratio is 30 to one. Meaning that if you put too much carbon relative to the nitrogen in the pile, then the decomposition is going to take much longer. Um, and you want to kind of get the process going. You don't want to wait years and years for your compost. You want to wait months or, or so for your compost. So the, the closer you can get to that 30 to one ratio, the faster your, your decomposition is going to occur and the faster you're going to get your usable compost. Um, so the general kind of idea for a pile is you want to have one half to three quarters of your pile um, be composed of carbon rich materials and then you want just significantly less nitrogen rich materials so quarter to half of your pile there's no um there's no set like measure everything out to the exact this is kind of like an inexact science um so i found a really excellent resource for this um this was through the arkansas cooperative extension service um and they have an excellent just multiple files on composting and uh, resources for that. So uh, I found particularly helpful their overall um, outline on this, which was the composting FSA uh, 2087 document. It was really an excellent source and I really recommend that if you wanna get more into the details of this. Um, so here's some examples of carbon to nitrogen ratios of greens and browns. So you can see that like I said, not all um, of these are created equal. So something like woody chips, 700 to one. That means that you want to put a minimal amount of woody chips in your composting pile. Whereas it would be so much better to put fruit waste because this is closer to 30 to one. So you can use these guides and uh, that one document I was mentioning earlier, um, that it has an excellent table, like it's over a page long of the different carbon to nitrogen ratios. So you can kind of get an idea of how much um, carbon and nitrogen each thing has and how much you should kind of put in. So at pretty much any resource you read, it's going to say go light on the, the nitrogens or go light on the, the brown um, composting materials. So things like, like woods, twigs, branches, uh, things like that. And then you wanna go a little heavier on the greens compared to that. Um, so we're gonna talk, now when we have like a basic understanding, we're gonna talk more in detail about four different kinds of composting. Um, the, this is not even just all of composting. These are just four that I thought um, would be pretty helpful to know about. So one is backyard leaf composting. Uh, the next one is three bin composting. Then we have vermicomposting and compost tumblers. So going first into the backyard leaf compost. So I'm sure everybody at some point has um, 
you know, made a leaf pile in their yard when you're cleaning up after the fall. Um, and so this can be made strictly of your leaves or you can use that environment to also start composting other things in your yard and your kitchen. So maybe you wanna put yard clippings or twigs or you know, food scraps in there as well. Um, but the thing with the, the composting piles like this is you have to be mindful of the size of it and also the moisture content. So uh, the recommended dimensions of a leaf pile are four feet in diameter and three feet high. And you don't want it any bigger than 10 feet in diameter and five feet high. Um, and so this all has to do with the ability of oxygen to get into the middle of the compost pile. And we're also going to monitor the moisture in this just by, you can monitor it just by touching the leaf pile. Um, so the general kind of saying for moisture content in compost is that it should feel like a wrung out sponge. So it shouldn't be dripping any kind of water, but it should be like damp. Um, and the reason you don't want to have too much water is because you're going to start to get um, kind of like a leachate instead of a healthy compost. And so to talk more about the inner workings of that, that compost pile, you can't have too big of a pile because then you're going to have a really hard time getting oxygen into your uh, middle of the compost pile. Whereas if it's too small, it's actually not going to be able to retain the heat. So what happens once those microbes um, become active in the leaf pile, they're going to start heating things up and they're going to start decomposing. And as they're doing that, it's going to get hotter and hotter. And that's going to aid the decomposition even further. Um, so you have to be mindful to, uh, to have that kind of sweet spot of a size. Another thing that you can do to kind of get your compost pile started is to add some soil to it. Um, leaves don't readily have a lot of um, organisms kind of on them and, you know, willing to, to kickstart that compost. So it, you can really help your compost get started faster if you add some soil to it and mix it up. Um, and another thing you can do is contain your pile. Uh, it doesn't necessarily just have to be a pile in the yard. You can put it in kind of like a box-like structure. Um, some things that are important to uh, consider here is that you need oxygen to penetrate the composting pile. So whatever container you do build or buy, uh, it has to have um, slots or, or mesh on the side or something because that oxygen needs to be able to get in there. Um, so you can uh, build these out of things uh, that you might have in your garage, maybe. So some leftover wood, uh, some mesh, uh, whatever you can create a bin. Another thing is you do usually want it to be able to open so that you can go in there with a pitchfork and rotate it. Um, so the reason you rotate a compost pile is, again, to get that oxygen in. And what you're doing is you're kind of taking the compost in the middle and bringing it out and then taking the ones that were on the outside and putting them inside so that everything has a chance to get decomposed. Uh, so when you have a leaf pile, the kind of standard practice is that you should go out and you should turn it at least once per month. Um, and then you shouldn't really touch it at all during the winter months because uh, it's cold out and you don't want to release the heat in that compost pile. Um, so you do also, again, have to monitor the, the moisture of the compost pile throughout the months. So when it's a hot month, you might want to go out there uh, every couple of weeks or so and just feel the compost and see if it's dry or not. So if it's really dry, you're going to want to add water. Again, you want to just add enough so that the compost pile feels like a wrung out sponge. Um, and so this isn't the most speedy kind of compost method, uh, especially when you you have a high leaf concentration. Um, that's going to take four to nine months to get a usable compost out of that. Um, and so once it is ready, you'll know it's ready because it's it's not going to be recognizable. It's not going to look like leaves anymore or whatever food scraps you put in there. It's going to be this dark brown color and it's going to be kind of crumbly. Um, if you're using a leaf compost, meaning that it's mainly composed of leaves, this is not really something that you're going to want to use as a fertilizer because it's going to be low in nutrients. Whereas if you use something that's high in food scraps, that's going to be higher in nutrients. Um, but you can use a leaf compost as kind of like a mulch that you can kind of put around your garden or 
for your trees. You can use it as a soil amendment and as a soil conditioner. So meaning you can mix it in with your gardens and um, whatever to um, increase the the texture of it so that it helps retain moisture more easily and helps control the, the nutrient take up in the plants. The next kind is the three bin composting. This is a really interesting one. Uh, so you're kind of using the same principles as the, leaf, the backyard leaf composting, except you're breaking it down into smaller piles and this is going to produce a usable compost much faster. So whereas the other one took four to nine months, you might get um, a compost done in three months with this one. Um, so th you're basically rotating between three different bins. Your first bin is going to be your fresh compost. So this is going to be your, your layers of brown and greens um, and you're going to layer them. Um, and again, you're going to pay attention to the moisture content. If you put food scraps in there that are very high in moisture, you're going to want to add um, something like shredded paper or shredded card cardboard or something in there that can help uh, regulate the amount of moisture. Um, and then what you're going to do once you stack your, your compostables in the first bin is you're going to leave it for a little bit and then you're going to go back and you're going to rotate it um, every couple of days. So like at least once a week or so. And that's going to help you aerate the pile and decompose it faster. So after, you know, about two weeks or so, you can switch over the compost from bin one over into bin two. And then you'll start a new compost pile the same way in bin one. Then you're going to, um, every time you go out and you rotate bin one, you're going to rotate bin two. You're going to turn the pile for another two weeks or so. Um, and again, you're not it is a, there's no particular time frame. It really depends on um, the climate outside, uh, the, the moisture and the temperature. So in the summer, it might go quicker, whereas in the fall, it might go slower. Um, but the overall goal here is to rotate um, the contents of bin one into bin two and then bin two into bin three. So after that bin two has been sitting there for a couple weeks, it should look um, more like a compost and less like the, the input material. And after those two weeks, you'll put it in bin three. This is kind of like your holding tank uh, where you're gonna let it sit for another two weeks or so. And then you can just keep your compost ready to use in that third bin. Um, and so, if you want to get kind of fancy with it, you can get a compost thermometer and you can check the internal temperature of those leaf or of your compost piles. And if it's around 140 to 150, that's pretty optimal. And that's when you should rotate it. If you don't want to get a thermometer, that's fine. And you can just kind of go on the, like every third day, I will go out and rotate um, and turn the piles. Um, and so there's lots of uses for this kind of compost. Um, so you can, uh, again, you can add it directly to your garden, use it in any other way that you would use in your typical garden. Um, or you can do something called lasagna gardening, which is kind of cool. So you can basically layer different uh, materials such as branches or hay um, with compost and uh, cardboard, for example. There's, again, no strict science to this. I've seen it done a lot of different ways. Um, so this is one thing you could also do if you don't wanna dig a garden bed, you could actually just like pick a spot in your yard where you want to have a garden and you can lay down like hay and then a layer of cardboard and then a layer of compost. And you can just let it sit there for a few months, like over the winter, so that it's ready for the springtime. And then you'll have ready to use um, uh, garden beds by the time that's done. Um, so this is a diagram of that, just showing that you can, there's no science to it. You can use branches, you can use hay, compost, newspapers, grass clippings, um, and you can layer it so that you create kind of a diversity of structure and nutrient inputs in your garden bed. So vermicomposting, this is my favorite topic of all the composting topics. Um, 
so this one is quite different than the other one. So you're going to be using actual worms as your mechanism of composting rather than turning. Um, and the kinds of worms you need, they're called red worms, which is Asenia fetida. Um, and they're really great organisms. Uh, they do a lot of work in a very short period of time. Um, and I, I understand that some people might be like, I'm never touching the worms. Uh, so this maybe isn't for you, but if you're if you want to be friends with worms, then this is definitely like a cool way to go about composting. Um, so this kind of composting is going to rely mainly on food scraps rather than like leaf inputs. Um, so you can have one of these containers um, under your kitchen sink. You can have it in your basement, outside. Um, it, it's really a versatile kind of composting and it's really good um, for an option for indoor composting. So if you don't really want to be outside too much, but you still want to compost, this is a really good option. Um, and a, lo a lot of people have a concern with indoor composting that it's going to smell or something, but as long as you properly maintain a vermicomposting bin, then you shouldn't have any smell issues. Um, and it's good because you can kind of customize it to your needs. Maybe if you're in an apartment, you can scale down in size, whereas if you have like a full house or something like that, you can kind of up your verma, verma composting um, bin. Um, again, you can keep it in your house or you can keep it outside. Just a couple things to consider is that there's worms in there and they, they work optimally um, at warmer temperatures. However, you don't want to ever expose them to freezing conditions uh, because that could kill them. And you also don't want to have the um, temperature go too hot, like around 90 degrees or something like that, because that could also kill them. Uh, so the way you make a vermicomposting bin is you can actually just use like a, like a container that you've maybe stored your sweaters in or something, or you can go out and buy one, um, and you just drill holes along the um, perimeter of this, um, and you want them to be on the side because instead of the lid, because if you do want to keep this outside, then you um, don't want the rain to get in. So if you keep the holes strictly on the side, then you'll be able to move your composting bin um, indoors and outdoors, whatever you need to do. Um, so a couple of things though, is that I, this is all about surface area with vermicomposting, not about depth. So the bigger is kind of better, um, not necessarily deeper. Um, so it should be at least two by one by one. Uh, you can build this out of wood if you'd like, or you can again, just use a plastic container. Um, and then what you're going to do once you have your container is you're going to put bedding in there. And there's lots of different sources of bedding. Um, ones that I've commonly read about are shredded newspaper and shredded cardboard. Um, and these are really great because they're going to help with the moisture content in the bin. Um, and then you're also going to mix that bedding uh, substrate with some soil. Again, half a cup, a cup. Uh, no exact science here, and, and then you're going to mix it all together. Um, and then you're going to add some water to it, right? You want to have it damp, like that wrung out sponge kind of um, consistency. And then you can um, add your worms. So you should have eight inches of bedding and go through that procedure before you do add your worms. I didn't look into where to buy the burn, the worms, but I'm sure that you can order them or maybe get in contact with a supplier through like um, a nursery or something like that. Um, so to start the bin, um, you're going to dig a hole on one side of the bin. So this is the simplest way I've seen it. There's, again, lots of different ways to go about this, but this seems to be like a pretty easy way. Um, so you'll dig a hole and then you're going to add your worms and about a pound of food scraps. Um, now this isn't like an exact number either. Maybe you can add a little more, maybe you add less. It depends on how much composting material you have at the time. And then you're just going to cover 
the worms with the um, bedding. So worms like to be underground and so they don't like sunlight. So something important here is also whatever container you do use, especially if you're gonna use a plastic one, you don't want it to be see-through because you don't want the worms to be bothered by the light. So using like a, a dark blue or a black bin or something like that is gonna be better than a see-through one. And you're gonna cover them so that they feel like they're underground and that's going to kind of spark them to get going on the food. Um, you may need to add more water, it depends. Um, and then another thing is that you can cover the top layer of this with newspaper or paper. Um, and the reason that you might wanna do this is because I've, I've read of people saying that um, the worms try to kind of climb up the side of the bin or they kind of come out of the ground instead of staying in the bedding. And so if you put a layer of paper or newspaper that's damp on top, they're more likely to stay in um, and, and continue decomposing the, the food scraps. Um, so again, if you wanna get really into it and like really technical, the worms work best at temperatures between 60 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and you can get a, uh, a thermometer to keep track of that. If not, you should just kind of be mindful um, of the temperature in terms of what it is in relation to outside. Um, if it's really hot out, you might not, you want to keep them in a shady spot or in a basement or something so that they're not overheating. Um, whereas if it's really cold outside, um, you're going to want to keep them inside or if you're in that kind of climate, or you're going to want to wrap the bin in like uh, some sort of insulating material. Uh, people use blankets, for example. Um, or if your home is just warm enough to sustain that, then that's fine as well. But then over time, um, what you're going to have to do is you're going to alternate where you bury your food scraps. So if you recall from the other slide, we started out on the right side of the bin, um, but then we're going to move it over to the left side of the bin. And the reason we're doing that is because as the worms break down the food material, they're going to create what is called worm casting, um, which is just a fancy word for poop. Um, so as they create those castings, you're going to want to harvest them because that's your usable compost. Um, so what you do to kind of get them to move so that you don't scoop them up while you're trying to harvest it is you move their food source to the other side of the bin. Um, so you might want to do this like uh, three weeks or so before you're going to harvest the worm castings from the other side. So you'll go in, you'll dig your little hole, you'll put your food scraps in there. Um, and you'll do the same process. And over time, the worms will move over to the other side of the bin so that this whole other side is free for you to harvest your worm castings. Um, a couple other things I wanna mention here um, is that the worms are really great at decomposition. They do it very fast. Um, so this could take less than a month um, if you have a, a well-established worm compost, uh, or it could take less than three months if you have a really well-established uh, worm colony and everything. Um, more likely than not your first time, it's gonna take three to six months. Um, you're gonna wanna start with a pound of worms. Uh, you can put two pounds of worms or more if, if that's something you wanna do, but the worms are going themselves to reproduce. Um, and they're going to increase that worm colony over time. Um, what else did I want to say here? Also monitor the moisture because a lot of people will think that it's normal to have water at the bottom of their vermicomposting uh, bin, and that's not normal. If you have too much water, that means that your compost is not being maintained properly. and You need to add more bedding to soak up the liquid. Um, and of course, you will have to add more bedding throughout the whole process regardless of this because the worms need that to uh, live in. Um, you can add about a pound of food scraps per week or you can even add more. Um, I've read that some people can uh, compost over three pounds of food per week. Um, so you're gonna wanna keep an eye on your, your compost every week, especially when you're first starting it to see where you're at. So if you put your compost in the, the pile, 
or you put those food scraps in the pile and you come back in a week and you see that there's still a lot of really big chunks of food um, and things like that, then uh, your compost is going to take longer. You might want to add more worms even. Um, or you might want to decrease the amount of food scraps you put in per week. Um, whereas if you do check it and you see that there's not really a lot of food scraps left, you might even want to up the amount of food scraps you give the worms every week. Um, so it's all about keeping an eye on it, seeing how the colony is going um, over time. And so there's lots of uh, purposes for the, the worm castings. And so you do need to harvest them some people, I guess, just scoop it out and use it. I've also seen people take a bucket and then you'll put a sifter over it and then you'll you'll sift the, the casting over that. And the purpose of that is to kind of pick out any sort of large food scraps that may not have been decomposed um, or like pits, for example. Some people will put like the pits of fruits and stuff in there, those take a really, really long time to decompose and you don't necessarily want to put that in your garden. Um, so you can make your own sifter. Um, I saw that some people have just kind of taken like a wire meshing and just kind of stapled it onto a wooden frame. And then you just always have a sifter to um, put your castings through. Um, again, you don't, this is not necessary, you don't have to do this. Um, there's also a different kind of vermin composting that uses these things called compost towers. Um, the reason I went with this one to explain is because those cost a lot more money, um, especially if you go for the fancier ones, um, and they're a little bit more complicated to build even if you're going to make it out of like plastic containers. So this seems to work really well for a lot of people and it's very simple. So you just kind of put your food in there, you bury it with the worms, and then you let it uh, sit for a couple weeks. Um, another thing here is that to aid the whole process of decomposition, it's really good to chop up the food scraps into smaller pieces. So instead of just putting like, for example, a whole banana peel, the decomposition is going to occur faster if you chop up that banana peel before you put it in the composting bin. So um, in general, you want to chop up your composting material before you do put it in the composting bin. Um, so I've seen lots and lots of cool uses for vermicompost. Um, so one of them is to use the, the um, castings directly as a fertilizer. So this is a, kind of like a mild fertilizer. Uh, this is going to be a much better fertilizer than if you thought like you could use leaf compost, which is comparatively very low in nutrients. Um, so you can add this directly to your gardens, um, or you can mix it in with the soils. You can also, um, whenever you're planting a new plant, uh, you can give it kind of like that jump start, put that compost in there with the plant when you're planting it. Another thing you can do is make what's called a compost tea. Um, so this is really interesting. So you can take kind of like a, a cloth material. So some people have used things like uh, cheesecloth. Uh, that's, however, not the most recommended material, but basically any kind of material bag that you can put compost in, that water is going to be able to go in and out of it, you can use. Uh, so you get like a five-gallon bucket um, and you fill it up with water. Um, and it's important for the compost tea that you use um, non-chlorinated water because the whole purpose of a compost tea is to um, encourage microbial activity. Um, and if you add chlorine, that's going to kill a lot of microbes. So if you're looking to make a compost tea, make sure you use non-chlorinated water for this. So you'll take your worm castings, you'll put them in some sort of um, like bag or material, and you'll hang it over the side of the bucket. And then you'll also have in there an aquarium pump. There's also specifically compost tea aerators, which are really interesting. They're kind of like a, a snake shape, and then you put it in the bucket, and it, they're just significantly better at aerating the compost tea, whereas the aquarium pump is going to struggle a little bit because um, the bubbles are just coming from the bottom of the bucket rather than throughout the whole water column of that bucket. And then you leave it for... I guess like a day or a day and a half or so 
and it just creates this brown water looking kind of tea. Um, and so then you can put that compost tea directly into your garden. You could water your plants with it. Uh, a lot of people swear this is like the greatest thing they've ever used in their gardens. And I also just today um, looked up some of the, the recently published literature on this. So you can do this too. You go to Google Scholar and then you type in compost tea and you change the um, time frame to 2020. And you'll see a lot of papers actually where people are researching the compost tea um, and its efficiency in sustainable agriculture. And what they're finding is that the compost tea actually tends to increase crop yield. And also it can, in some instances, increase the quality of it. So it's kind of like an alternative to a chemical fertilizer, um, which is good for um, with the whole theme of what ambassadors do because then you're keeping those chemicals out of the waterways. So this is a really interesting way to kind of supplement your, your garden without resorting to a chemical fertilizer and kind of literally recycling um, anything that you can uh, to create um, a good garden. Uh, the last one is a compost tumbler. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because this is the most boring way to compost in my opinion. Um, so this is where you basically go to the store and you buy a tumbler. You can go to like Lowe's, Home Depot, Walmart, and you can get a tumbler. Um, and basically you just layer your greens and browns inside of the compost uh, tumbler, um, either with as much compost material as you have or with uh, or until it's about full. Um, and then you just close it and you go out and you turn it every like other day or so. Um, couple things with this though, you do want to put it in a sunny location because you want this to get hot. And this is going to be the fastest way you can make compost. So if you put it out in the sun, you go out there and you rotate it every other day or so, um, then you should have usable compost in a month or two. Um, and sometimes even less. Some people get compost from a tumbler in like three weeks. Um, and so again, the tumbling really is just going to introduce more oxygen and speed up the process. Um, this one up here, uh, this is a dual tumbler. So this kind of has the same idea as that um, the three bin composting concept where one is like your new compost and one is like your working compost. So you would go in and you would layer your compost material and you'd start this one, then you'd switch it over uh, or then you would um, use that other one for a new compost. And you just, again, you tumble it over time and it creates a usable compost. Um, I did see in terms of price range, seems like tumblers are anywhere from like $80 to, I guess, real fancy ones, like over $300. I guess it depends on the volume and the quality of the product um, and how fast you're looking to compost, right? So to kind of give you a comparison of the different kinds of composting we've talked about, that leaf composting pile is going to take the longest to produce a usable compost, whereas a tumbler is going to produce um, a usable compost in the least amount of time. Um, in terms of ease of use, I guess tumbler could be the most, it's easy in the sense that you just kind of put stuff in the tumbler and then you rotate it, but it does require that you go out on a, you know, daily basis basically and tumble it. If that's something you're not really interested in doing, then the vermicomposting, in my opinion, is probably one of the easiest ones to do because you just collect your food scraps and then once a week you go and you feed your worms and that's kind of it. And then you add water when it's needed, which is not very often, especially if you're putting uh, food scraps that are, um, pardon me, uh, moist. Um, and then the three bin is going to be really good if you're an active gardener and you like being outside. Um, and that's gonna produce a usable compost in a pretty short period of time. So about three months or so. So different kinds of methods. Um, hopefully some of these, um, one of these methods maybe kind of clicks with your lifestyle um, and what you wanna do.
um, as with anything else, there are definitely issues that come with uh, composting. And usually the biggest problem is people will say that they smell. Um, and so all that really means is that it's not getting enough oxygen. Uh, so your composting shouldn't ever smell as long as you're maintaining it. So if you're, you're not rotating it often enough, it's going to smell. So the quick fix to that is just to go out and turn your pile more often. Um, if the pile has more of like an ammonia odor, then that just means you have too many greens. All you do is you add more brown materials. So things like leaves and straw, and then you mix the pile. Again, always look at the moisture content of your compost pile. If it's too dry, just go ahead and add um, some water to it. And again, you just want it uh, wet enough that it feels like a, a damp sponge. Um, if your compost is taking a really, really long time, uh, that could be that your pile is um, not of the right dimensions um, or you're putting too, you're, you're kind of too far away from that 30 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio. If your compost pile has a very low temperature, um, that could also mean that there's, it's too cold. Um, and that could be because your pile is entirely too small um, or it has poor aeration. Um, again, a lot of fixes to this is either to add some material to it, add water if it's too dry, turn the pile if you need more oxygen, and then if you don't have enough nitrogen, you just add more of a nitrogen-rich um, composting material. If you see that your compost is being attacked by um, animals like, like, I don't know, raccoons or something, then that means that you probably are putting foods in there like, or accidentally maybe you have like meaty or fatty food scraps in there and you want to avoid that at all costs. And also, uh, it could also just mean that you're not burying your food scraps properly. So you shouldn't have any pest problems as long as every time you add food scraps to your pile, you're burying them. So even with the three bin, uh, whenever you're adding scraps, you want to bury them within the compost. You don't want to just leave them out. So a lot of times people will layer their greens and, and browns and then put like paper, like shredded paper over the top or something like that to kind of contain the pile. Um, if composting sounds really good in theory to you, but you don't really want to do it yourself, there's also services to you. In Sussex County, at least, there's, there's not a service that I know of that will come to your house, for example, and pick up food scraps. But you can bring your lawn clippings and leaves and stuff to the Sussex County Municipal Utilities Authority. Um, and so you can just bring your, your brown bags of leaves and they will take care of it for you and they will actually compost it. And then if you want the compost, you can buy some from them. So you can supply, supply them with the material and then you can come back later on and buy some compost if that's what you'd like to do. Um, for the most part, if you're like a resident and you don't have a lot of like leaves or something, like tons, they're not really gonna charge you for dropping off your leaves. Um, but if you have like a lot, then they, they'll charge you, I think, five to $40, depending on the weight of it. So either way, pretty cheap way to get rid of your leaves uh, and uh, a good way to get rid of them too, because they're going to compost it. Um, you can also purchase from the uh, Sussex County Municipal Utilities Authority um, mulch, uh, compost, one other thing, can't remember. But you can purchase these things from the Municipal Utilities Authority and it's all coming from their, their composting recycling program, which is really great. Um, so with that, uh, that's the end of that. And uh, if you do the um, read squared uh, point system with the library, the code for this presentation is WASTE with um, all capital letters. So, yeah, any questions from you guys? I have a question. Sure. Um, I live